Neutrality must be given from the judgment seat. Neutrality is absolutely impossible. Right. And he must decide right. this question and answer this question. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And his pilot sees the bitterness and the hatred of that devil man, hell infuriated multitude. Right. For he knows that for envy the chief priests have delivered him. He asked this important question. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Now you know that this is an informative question. You know the two names that Pilate oh, used. Please. The name of Christ, the name of Jesus, and the name of Christ. And these two names are associated with two great facts. Amen. The name Jesus Amen. reveals the Savior, Savior's purpose, the Savior's passion. He came to this world to seek and to save sinners. He had never been found among any of the guilty sons of Adam's race. Were it not for the fact that He came to seek and to save Amen. that which is lost. Amen. Yes, you in the Greek, Joshua in the Hebrew. The name means Savior. Thou shalt call His name Jesus. For He shall save His people from their sins. And so the question before us tonight is what shall I do then with Jesus which is called Christ? What will you do with the Savior? What's your attitude toward Him? Do you believe in His mission to this world? Now the world of religion is torn with controversy as to why Christ came. But there's no need for any, any doubt whatsoever. Come on. He came to seek and to save Amen. that which is lost. Amen. It is not by His perfect, sinless life that men are saved. It is not by His example, but it is by His death and the blood of the crucified that men are saved. He came to deal with sin. He came to purge sin. He came to put away sin. And that's why He came to this earth to seek and to save that which is lost. And so the Lord Jesus came to seek and to save sinners. Many years ago I was preaching in a revival in a meeting in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And one day they asked me to come out and preach at the Paterno plant down on the Mississippi River. And at that time at least they made these large barges that carry oil rigs, oil rigs out to sea. They had two services, one at one o'clock and one at two. At the first service I preached from that, that verse, 1 Timothy 1, 15. This is a faithful saying. Amen. Worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came the world to save sinners. After the service was over, a dear man who looked to me in his mid-fifties came up to me and he was weeping. And he said, honestly, preacher, I did not know until today why Jesus died. I knew that he died, but I did not know that he died for me. You write that verse of Scripture down just as soon as I get home, I want to read it again. I do not know if he was ever saved or not, but the Holy Spirit made him see that day that Christ came to seek and to And every person must answer this question, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? You need a Savior. You cannot deal with your sins without Christ. And you're going to die. With your sins stand you in the face at the great white throne judgment when the books are open. All the secrets and all the sins of men shall be revealed. What will you do at the great white throne judgment when that throne is suspended in space in a starless night without a moon? And that on that great white throne judgment sets the Lord of glory and the books are open. And men were judged of those things which are written in the books. Oh. Every sin will face you again. Sins that were committed in the days of childhood. Sins committed in the days of youth. Sins committed in adulthood. Sins committed on the cover of night. Sins committed in broad daylight. And like
back of mighty army. Those in the judgment, the great white throne judgment, are unsaved. The mere fact that they're there declares that they're sinners right. and they're going to face their sins. Right. And all your sins shall march before you like a mighty army. And all those sins will cry out, guilty, right. guilty, right. guilty. And in that hour there will be no blood to avail. There will be no grace or peace to be found. Right. You will face your sins again. And so the question tonight is what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? You can face your sins tonight. You can have your sins pardoned. And you can be justified. You may have been in this building bowed down with the guilt of sin. But you can leave tonight saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Saved. Saved, saved by the blood Amen. of the crucified one. You're going to have to deal with your sin, either in this world or the great white throne judgment. And so every person must answer the question, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? This declares the Savior's person, Christ, a force in history. Christ of the great Means Messiah in the Hebrew means the anointed one. He is the anointed. He is not anointed to be prophet, priest, and king. And every man needs a prophet to reveal the way of God. They need a priest, not an earthly priest, but a heavenly priest to accomplish the way of salvation by the outpouring and the sacrifice of His own blood on the cross. And they need a king to crush sin, to triumph over sin. And the only one that fits the bill is the Lord Jesus, his prophet, priest, and king. He came to reveal the way of God. He came to accomplish the way of salvation. For he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he is king who can triumph over sin in your life and give you victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. God has appointed no one else but his own darling son to take away sin. There is not a priest on earth. That can forgive your sin. There's not a Baptist preacher that can forgive your sin. I could not cleanse my own self, let alone anyone else. But I do know that there is a Savior who is mighty to save. And I know that there is a fountain filled with blood. And yet the sinner and the prince beneath that flood may lose all in his Search the scriptures. For in them uh, you think you have eternal life. For they are they which testify of me. I would not dare face eternity with anything less than assurance from this book that I'd pass from death unto life. Good preacher. I wouldn't, I wouldn't base salvation on something I'd seen or even something I felt. But John said these things that I've written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, of course, I don't go for feelings. But I am grateful that I can feel as I go. And when God saved me, He did give me joy unspeakable and full of glory. But it's all based upon His Word. I'm going to heaven because of the finished work of God's I'm not climbing up a ladder. I'm not building a bridge. I'm testing in nothing more. Every act, every 
sin infallibly recorded. Again at the great white throne, Revelation chapter 20 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged of those things which were written in the book according to their works. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This is a personal question, a personal factor. God is keeping the record for the judgment day. Nothing is hidden from Him. And Christ stood before Pilate. And we have the record of that trial that I just read in Matthew chapter 27. But the trial of Jesus Christ before you and what you do with the Son of God is being recorded just now. Yes. And your answer will decide your eternal destination. Amen. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ, whosoever is not found written in the book of life, no matter what a person has, no matter how, how that person may have lived, whether they were rich or poor, educated or uneducated, every person whose name is not in the book of life shall be cast in the lake of fire. When men come to die, they all come to the same place. Some years ago, I was in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I went out to Crown Point Cemetery. And I know that you must think I live in cemeteries. Hmm? But I have learned a lot out at, at cemeteries. Oh, yes, and I was visiting Crown Hill Cemetery. And in the, that cemetery, Benjamin Harrison, the 23rd President of the United States is buried. There are several United States Senators, several Postmaster Generals, and the Supreme Court Justices, and poets and other famous people. But uh, just a short distance from the grave of, of the 23rd president is another grave with just a little white marker. And it's the grave of the infamous gangster, John Dillinger. And I thought as I looked at that grave, just a short distance from the grave of the 23rd president of the United States, it does not matter when men come to die. They all come to the same place. It is upon it. Under men wants to die. After this, the judgment. There's a time factor. Pilate could not put this question off. Until the next day, it had to come to an immediate decision. And there is a time factor. Yes, sir. God does call for the last time. God in mercy may call you many more times, but on the other hand, He may never call again. Amen. This book says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Yeah. Call upon Him while He is near. Yeah. And tonight if God is speaking to you, God is calling you, the time is now. Right. Behold, a day is the day of yeah. salvation. Yeah. Now is the accepted time. Yes. Time will run out. Time is a great mystery. We're amazed at, at when we're young at how slow it passes by. And when we get older, we're amazed at how fast it goes by. Amen. And the very fact that we cannot get adapted to time may be proof that we are headed for eternity and that eternity is our home and not time. Amen. Not every day. When you have an opportunity to seek the Lord, you must come in the day of His power. Amen. Jesus said, No man can come unto me except my Father which has sent me, so draw Him. Amen. Now sometimes I, I think, Brother Daniel, people get the idea that if we just had this preacher come preach to us, or if we had this group to sing to us, we'd really have a meeting. But I remind you that all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes. That's why we praise the lady saying by the call. Oh Lord, send the power just now. And never show the quickening power of God and resurrect those that are dead in trespasses and sin. And He must convict. And He must convince. For there will be no conversion. You're right. And then there's a consequential factor. 
consequences. There are consequences. He rejected the Son of God. Born with the crowd. And every person who sits under gospel preaching knows that there are consequences in rejecting Christ. And if your conscience is never disturbed anymore, it is because that conscience has been seared. And because it is not open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care how wicked a person may be. It is impossible to sit under the preaching of the gospel. And not be aware that it is a terrible thing to reject Jesus Christ. For this gospel is not just the words of men. The apostle Paul said, our gospel came not in word only, but in power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost with much assurance. Consequential factor of rejecting Christ is eternal damnation. There is no hope. For the soul that rejects Jesus Christ. You can read the Old Testament and the New Testament through. And you cannot find one passage that tells you that there is hope after death. Where the tree falleth, there shall it lie. There's no purgatory. There's no limbo. There's no stopover. If salvation is not attained in this life, then you shall eternally be separated from God. Jesus was the greatest preacher of all times on hell. Thirteen times in his recorded preaching ministry, he gave us the most terrible and the most vivid and the most awesome descriptions of hell. He described it as the blackness of outer darkness where their worm dieth not, or their conscience will never die, and where the fire does not quench, eternally suffering in the regions of the town without God. With all the suffering in hell, one of the greatest sufferings is the absence of the presence of God. And then there's the influential factor. Men do not go to hell alone. If you could damn your own soul, and not influence anyone else. Your judgment would be a lot easier. Did you know that there are degrees of judgment? Jesus said, What are the Chorazin and Beth saying? For the mighty works which were done in Tyre and had that were done in Tyre and Sidon that had been done here, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. I said to you, it shall be more time of the day of the judgment for those cities than for you. I'd hate to go, of course, from, uh, leave out of, from any part of this globe without Christ in my heart. But especially from America. And especially from the Southland. Where we have free access to the gospel. Now I'm not naive enough to believe that every building that has a steeple on it. And that every place that is called a church or whatever it's called. That not always is the gospel preached. But I do know that there are places and there are faithful men who preach the gospel. And if people are not hear the gospel, it is not a lack of information. It is a lack of inclination. They have no desire to hear the gospel. And I would hate to die from, from the Southland with the gospel ringing my ears. Your, your life influences others. Your life will either live on for God or live on for evil. That's true of the saved and the unsaved. Now there are some people their memory comes to our minds. It's a blessed thing. And we're encouraged to continue in, in faithfulness to the things of God. Just that memory is a blessed thing for the memory of the just is blessed. Amen. On other hands, there are those who live such a life that their very memories are the pressing thing. And you think about an individual maybe that fought the church, that fought the work of God, and just their memory is depressing. Your influence lives on. You're either influencing men for Christ or people against Christ. Brother Clifford Kelly, my dear friend down in East of South Carolina, Went home to be with the Lord just a few years ago and I had the, the humble and honor to, to help at his funeral. But Brother Kelly, by profession, was a mortician out in Chattanooga, Tennessee when the Lord saved him and 
called him to preach or called him to preach. And uh, he said one night he went into the funeral home that he worked. It was a large funeral home and he said because of the size of the funeral home and the size of the city sometimes there were several bodies lined up to be embalmed. And he said in the meantime he heard on the radio the radio announcer announced that Dr. Charles Weigel had just passed away that day. Dr. Weigel, as some of you may know, is the Baptist preacher who lived out in Florida. And when he announced his call to the gospel ministry, his wife walked off, said, I refuse to live with a preacher. And walked off, never returned again. Dr. Weigel became so depressed. He went out on the pier and he was getting ready to commit suicide. Oh. And God gave him that blessed old song. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. No one could take the sin and the shame from me. I'll never know why he came to save me until someday I see his blessed face on high. And Dr. Weigel said, Why for no wife? I'm going with God. And he did and was faithful. Until he was in his early 90s, God took him home. But Brother Clifford, my friend, said, I went into the funeral home that night and uh, was getting ready to do the embalming. And I looked on the tag, the name tag, on the toe of the first corpse. And it said, Dr. Charles White. In the meantime, the radio announcer was playing a recording of Dr. White was singing. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Brother Clifford said, I put on my uniform, whatever they wear, I got all that stuff on. Went in the embalming room and was getting ready to embalm Dr. Wilder. But he was still seen by recording. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. And my friend Brother Kelly said, God struck my soul. I had to go out, take all that stuff off. Walked up and down the hall and praised God. And he said, I came back in, put all that stuff back on, and started to embalm the body of Dr. Weigel again. But he was still singing, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. And God just overturned a bucket of liquid love in my soul. Took it all off again. And went out and walked the halls and praised God. And said, finally, after several attempts, I managed to embalm, embalm the body of Dr. Charles Weigel. Dr. Weigel was already in the presence of the Lord. But his influence for God is still in the Lord. You don't have to actually leave your body. Your influence is going to live on. And I think about great men and great soldiers and great ladies of the cross. And just their very memory encourages me to press on. You're going to leave your testimony behind. Either for God or against God. <laughs> Lastly, this is an inescapable question. There are some sounds ringing in the, in the ears of Pilate. His response to this question, what shall I do then with Jesus, was marked by carelessness, by cowardice, by cleverness, and by compromise. The voice of Christ. Paul writes to Timothy that Christ gave a good confession before Pilate. But Pilate would not listen. And our Lord gave a good confession by his speech and by his silence. But the governor, Pilate, Governor Pilate, would not listen. And the voice of Christ is sounded in your heart tonight by the Holy Ghost through the Word of God. And you must face and you must answer this question. What shall I do then with Jesus which is yeah, called Christ? Even while I stand before you preaching tonight, some of you may be deciding your answer and you're going to leave this building tonight either with Christ or against Christ. Amen. What shall I do with Jesus? The voice of Christ will ring in the ears of Pontius Pilate throughout eternity. Many years ago, my wife and I visited Lucerne, Switzerland, a beautiful town in the Swiss Alps. And uh, in the distance or close by to Lake Lucerne 
is a mountain that was named after Pilate, Pontius Pilate, called Mount Pilatus. For tradition says that after he left Judea, he spent his final days in that little town. And tradition says that he went out in the middle of Lake Lucerne and drowned himself. I do know this that throughout eternity, and I do know that for over 2,000 years, Governor Pilate has been screaming from the regions of the dam. And the voice of Jesus Christ is still <laughs> ringing in his ear. And this question, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? But he made his choice. And it's in eternity. That was the voice of his companion. Pilate's wife sent a message to her husband, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of Him. And if you reject Him, you will suffer the consequences. God has raised up the Lord Jesus from the dead. Acts chapter 2 is from chapter Brother Daniel was reading from. On that day of Pentecost, and Peter faced that multitude in the face and said... You hung God, have delivered him up of the determined counsel of God, and have with wicked hands of slain, but God hath raised him from the dead. He is the eternal Son of God that was crucified, buried, but he arose again. And the voice of Pontius Pilate's wife said, How thou nothing to do with that just man? I have suffered many things because of him. Now, people would love to destroy that name. But his name shall endure forever. Multitudes of people want to believe there's no God. They hope there's no God. Because if there is a God, there is a judgment day. And there is a payday for sin. But his name cannot be destroyed. His name shall endure forever. The psalmist said the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And the psalmist doesn't try to explain the existence of God. But he says if an individual says there's no God, that person's a fool. And, uh, and uh, so the Bible tells it that his name shall endure forever. And you cannot destroy. And you cannot erase his name. Abraham Lincoln once said if you argue with the fool, it becomes two fools arguing. But I'd like to add to that. You can win an argument with the fool. He won't know you want it because he's a fool. Right. And so the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now the atheists are always complaining that they don't have a special day like the Christian world to celebrate, such as Christmas or Easter. I'd like to suggest one. Amen. April 1st, Fool Day. His name shall endure forever. And God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Amen. 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 The voice of the crowd. Crucified. Crucified. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. I think it'd be safe to say that I've read at least five or six thousand pages of history concerning the Jewish Holocaust. Nearly six million of them died in Nazi Germany, Nazi-occupied lands. At the Auschwitz camp, one, one warehouse was filled with seven tons of human hair from Jewish bodies. They used the hair to make lampshades. One documented account says that it outs with it. That those Jews were whipped along barbed wire runways, being told that they were going to take showers. And then as they entered in the building, steel doors slammed shut. Interior vents turned, were turned on. And they died 2,000 at a time from the gas in, in, in agonizing spasms of death. Mm. Sometimes the other inmates were sent in to haul out their bodies, sometimes members of their own family. By their own friends. I visited the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that touched my heart especially, as you leave that museum coming out through the lobby, there's a pile of shoes that were taken from the, those victims of the Holocaust. And then there's a pile 
that is filled with little children and baby shoes. And sometimes the little children were taken and their heads were dashed against the wheels of the train. And I thought, as I visited once the Hertz Museum in Jerusalem, there are actual pictures of those Jews being placed in the cattle cars, being taken off to the death camps. And as I looked at those skeleton forms and saw the horror on their faces, I thought, surely they could not have known what they said when they cut out His blood be on us. And on our children. I remind you, not only was the blood upon those, their heads that rejected Him, but it's upon the blood of every person, whether you be Jew or Gentile. If you reject the blood of Jesus Christ, what should I do then with Jesus? Which is called Christ. Many years ago, I read one of the saddest stories I think I've ever read. One night, a couple out of the Midwest received a phone call from their son. We've been serving a tour of duty in Vietnam. And of course, they were delighted to hear his voice. And they talked for a while. And he told them that he, that he was in California. And of course, they were looking for him to, to uh, come home. And the young man said, I have a friend. He's been seriously wounded. One eye's missing. One arm's been blown away. And one leg is missing as well. And if you don't mind, I want to bring him home. And his mother and father stammered and stuttered and said, Well, we're not sure if we could take care of that. Maybe, maybe it'd be better if he went to some rehabilitation center. They noticed a change in their son's tone of voice. He said, Okay. High up the phone. A few hours later, they received a call from that same town in California, the Carter or whoever, who said, We believe we have the body of your son. And we need you to identify it. But they went to examine that body to their harm. They saw that one eye was missing. One arm was missing. And one leg was missing. That young man had been speaking about himself. And when he thought that he might be a burden to his family, he became so depressed that he didn't want to live anymore. And he committed suicide. But as tragedy, tragic as that is, I am sure, Brother Daniel, that if this community is like our community and every other community I know, the great majority can care less tonight than 2,000 years ago. God's darling son walked up the proud Calvary's hill, hung between hell and earth, and shed his blood for our sins. What should I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? I'm not asking you tonight what you're going to do with me or Brother Daniel Buchanan or some of these other men of God. But I'm asking you tonight, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? This is a question that you must answer. I'm afraid that many people allow the voice of the crowd to drown out the voices that would call for verdict that leads to salvation. And then Paul finds out that Jesus is from Galilee. And Herod is Caesar's representative in Galilee. And Herod is in town. And so relieved, Pilate sends Jesus before Herod. Herod hoped to see some miracles performed of him, but Jesus opened not his mouth. Heaven's always silent when you just come to be entertained. And then he appears back before Pilate. Pilate left the judgment seat. And news came to him, he's back. And Pilate discovers that Jesus is before him again. And he's going to have to give the verdict. He's going to have to answer this question. And that he cannot pass it on to someone else. And then Pilate says, I'll make a deal with the crowd. They have this criminal, this notorious criminal, this murderer, this sedition is called Barabbas. And I'll offer Barabbas. And I'll offer Jesus, the prophet, the healer, the miracle worker, the one who touched blinded eyes and made them see, who touched deaf ears and made them hear, who touched twisted limbs and made them straight. And I'll offer Barabbas or Christ. I'm sure they'll choose Christ. But to his heart, they cried Barabbas. And then they cried for Jesus to be crucified. 
And Pilate said, I'm innocent from... Uh, dipped his hands in waters and said, water and said, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. He washed his dirty hands, but not his dirty heart. <laughs> and he made up his... Made the choice. Yep. He gave the verdict to crucify Christ. And then Pilate says, I'll scourge him. I'll have his body beaten and broken and bruised and blue. I'll lacerate him. I'll humiliate him. And when the crowd sees his broken body, they'll say it's enough. And when Pilate had done all that, John's gospel says that Pilate says to the crowd, Behold the man. But as the crowd looks at Jesus of Nazareth and sees the bloody, bruised, beat body of the darling Son of God whose cheeks are stained with blood, they cry out even the more, Crucified! Crucified! And then Pilate had to give the sentence and they led him away to Calvary. And nailed his stark naked body to the cross. And there he died for my sin and your sin. You're going to do something with him tonight. You're going to refuse him. Or you're going to receive him. Oh. The close of World War II, the Prince of Wales who later became the King of England, was fished in a hospital at, hospital at Flanders Field. And after he visited all the soldiers, he said, is there anybody else that I might visit? Him? And whoever was in charge of the hospital said, there's one man, one soldier. But you don't want to see him. Nobody ever visits him. And the prince who later became the king of England said, take me to him. Went into a darkened room and there on the bed lay just the stump of a man. His eye, one eye was gone. His both arms were missing. Both legs were missing. And the Prince of Wales, who later became King Edward VIII of England, bent over that stump of a man, <laughs> lifted that stump of a man up into his arms, with tears streaming down his face, and said, Man, you did it for me. You did it for me. That's why I went to Calvary. That's why I suffered. That's why I bled. That's why I died. He did it all for me. And He did it for you. You're going to have to answer the, the question tonight. What shall I do then with Jesus? Which is called Christ. Ask our brother to come and lead us in some invitation number. 